Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Discerning the Voice of God. We are in week six. We are in our final week. I am so excited. This one was a good one. Oh, my goodness. Um, and we are on day one, Great Expectations, page 166. But before we get started, I finally went through my stuff. <laughs> and um, I have been praying. And so the, our next... Bible study is going to be from Priscilla's father, Tony Evans, and it's called Detours. And you can find this. I just looked it up to make sure that it was still available because this is really old. Um, you can find it on ChristianBook.com. Um, it's $14.99, I think. Yes, it's $14.99. Um, and so you can pick this up, and this is going to be our next, our next Bible study. And let me tell you. I don't know if you can find it or not because I haven't looked, but I listened to his sermon series on this a few years ago, and oh my gosh, it was so powerful, so powerful. It's all about um, Joseph and all of his detours, and it's just, it's absolutely amazing, and so if you can go back um, and find his sermon series on that, I would highly suggest that you listen to that because it was so powerful and profound. And I'll have to dig around and see if I can still find my gazillions of notes that I took off of that series. Um, I don't know if I kept them or not. Um, I throw stuff away and then I regret it. You know how that is. Um, but uh, I will look for that. But this is going to be our next our next study and I'm so excited. Now he does have a book that goes along with it, but you don't need to buy it unless you want to. Um, it's not necessary. This is the workbook and this is the one that is necessary. Um, I will, I will probably, I can't guarantee it, um, cause life is busy, but I will probably read this along with doing this and, um, read to you really important sections out of the book. Um, if I, if God deems it necessary, but, uh, you don't, you don't need the hard, you don't need this book. You just need this one. And I also need to go on YouTube and see if I can find the answers for <laughs> the video series. Um, but again, if you can go, um, and find his sermon series on detours, it was from several years ago, like three years ago, maybe, maybe four. I don't remember. It was super, super good. I think it was 2000, I think it was 2016 through 2017, if I recall correctly. Um, but it, it was so, 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 so good. So good. So I am really excited to do this one. It is so, so powerful. And, um, so again, you don't need the book. Um, you need the workbook. I will read from this. So, you know, it's up to you if you want to buy it or not, if you can afford it or not. But this is the one that you need. And again, you can get it at christianbook.com for $14.99 plus tax and all that fun stuff. So this is our next Bible series that we will be starting. And I'm so excited for that one because I bought it many, many years ago when I listened to that sermon series and I've never done it. So God has perfect timing for that. So let's pray and let's dig deep into discerning the voice of God our last week. Oh, precious daddy, you are so good and you lead and guide us every day, Father. And we just thank you, Lord, for all that you have taught us through this Bible study, Lord, and all you are going to teach us today, Father, and all that you are going to do in our lives, Father. Help us to have clear minds, Lord. Remove any distractions, Father. Help us to be completely and utterly focused on you, Lord, and what you want to show us today, Father. And I just thank you for what you have done in all these precious people's lives. And I just pray, Lord, that your will be done and that you will get all the glory, honor, and praise. We love you, Daddy. We trust you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, page 166, Great Expectations. Um, A.W. Tozer says, God will speak to the hearts of those who prepare themselves to hear. And conversely, those who do not so prepare themselves will hear nothing even though the word of God is falling upon their outer ears every Sunday. Mm, that is powerful, and that is so, so true. So she says, I hope you're still feeling hungry, spiritually speaking, wishing this what weren't, weren't, wishing this weren't, weren't, 
Maybe that should be wasn't. I don't know. <laughs> Our last week of study, wanting more of the closeness and connection you've been experiencing with God during these hours that we've been poised on the edge of our seats to hear him. Once you hear his voice, regular mundane versions of Christianity will never satisfy you again. You'll want to remain in a spiritual posture that invites a continual invasion of his manifest presence. You want to be proactively, consistently confirming your alignment with him, continually seeking him in his word, listening, looking, heeding, and hearkening. Your spiritual senses peak to recognize and discern when he is speaking. Any distance or dryness that threatens the gushing well of God's spirit in your life will feel like the worst of illnesses from now on. All you'll want to do is get over it, and get on with it. Back to the business of close, intimate, active relationship with God. This is where clear communication with God begins. A believer approaching her relationship with him from an ongoing stance of anticipation, readied and expectant to hear his voice. So she says to consider these three important words drawn from the last sentence. Anticipation, readiness, and expectation. And she asks, in one or two sentences, describe how you think this type of stance looks in the life of a believer. So I put that we're always leaning forward, anxiously ready to hear. And we're always having our ears ready, constantly listening and expecting to hear his voice. Um, so she says, now personalize your response. In what ways do you show anticipation, readiness, and expectation in hearing God speak? So I'm focused more on the word. I'm paying attention to words or verses that seem to pop out at me. And I'm listening to myself and to others more. I'm slowing down and really paying attention in case God is using someone else or myself. You know, I tend to, um, when, uh, when I'm trying to figure out something, I tend to speak out loud. And then I can hear it better because my mind gets all crazy. And so then I can hear God speak, even though he's using my words. And I'm like, oh, that's what that is. So I'm really trying to slow down and listen more. Um, she asks, in what ways, if any, are you a bit apathetic, indifferent, or dispassionate? And I said, sometimes I'm too busy to be listening actively or not focused when studying the word. Um, and that is true. And I'm, I'm a constant work in progress in that. Um, so I am so excited about this, this Habakkuk. Uh, this was, this was very, very eye opening to me. Um, and, and I'll explain some things in a bit. So she says, we know very little about Habakkuk. He was a prophet to God's people who had deep convictions regarding his faith and prevailing sensitivities about the injustices within his society. Apparently he was a man of diverse interests and talents and yet when his book opens, he is utterly consumed by one driving focus, to hear from God. So she says, read uh, verse, chapter 1, 2 through 3 uh, in the margin. So that says, how long, Lord, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you do not listen or cry out to you about violence and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? And I have to be honest, <clears throat> when I read that verse, all my first thought was, oh my gosh, we can all be praying that right now about all the junk that is going on in this world right now. All the crud that is going on with this stupid COVID crap. All the stuff that is going on with these stupid illegal evil mandates all the stuff that is going on with all the um transgender stuff all the stuff that is going on with them te teaching all this evil nasty sexual stuff to our children in school all this stuff going on with disney all the stuff going on in the white house all this stuff there's just so much stuff going on right now and it just it's just seems to just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more and and we don't even know which one to truly focus on because there's just so much and that's called distractions 
because every little thing that keeps popping up is a distraction to keep you unfocused from what the true underlying thing is. And the true underlying thing is evil, evil. Everything that is going on is evil. Everything that is going on is Satan's plan. But I have to tell you, God keeps speaking in my heart that God is setting the stage. We may not lack it. We may not lack that, that Biden is in office, quote unquote, because I don't believe he should be there. Um, we may not lack that this new judge came in because she is totally evil and lenient on so many different things. But God is setting the stage for all of this. He's he's getting all the actors in place. He is preparing everything because we are so, so very close to the end. And so I, he spoke to me that in the shower <laughs> last week. And I was just like, okay, I need to quit focusing on all the distractions. And I need to remember that I may not lack what's going on, but you've got this all under control and it's all part of your plan. This is all your will. Um, and so that, that verse really hit me because we could all be praying that. Why do we have to keep looking at this? Why, why are you not doing anything? Because he seems like he's not doing anything, but he is. He is. Um, so she says, describe the tone of Habakkuk's plea and record the key words from the passage that leads you to this conclusion. So I wrote, exhausted, frustrated, he feels ignored and forsaken. And I know a lot of times in my prayers, especially with what is going on in this world right now, that's exactly how I feel too. And so the key words that I wrote down were how long, do not listen, do not save, forced to look at injustice, and tolerate wrongdoing. And she says, what does this tell you about the prophet's emotional state at that time? And I put, he was depressed, overwhelmed, exhausted, frustrated, and longed for God to move. And I think we all feel like that right, right about now with all the junk that is going on. We are just overwhelmed exhausted about all this crud that they're trying to get us to do. We are frustrated that it doesn't seem like anything is happening or changing on the good side. And we are longing for God to move. And so it says, in your most recent conversations with God, what has your overarching term been, tone Sorry, been like? And I put grateful and hopeful, but I also circled discouraged and I put sometimes because I can get like that because I feel like I'm praying the same prayers over and over and over again and I'm not getting an answer. And again, God's giving me an answer. He's telling me I have to wait. So she says Habakkuk's key questions, how long and why, are a clear indicator of the sentiments in his heart. Aren't these the same two questions that haunt us as well when the circumstances of life seem to be closing in on us with no detectable end in sight? Particularly when we've been praying about the same things for an extended period of time, waiting on God to give an indication that he has heard us or even cares. We can become discouraged and depleted of hope. The, the divine silence scares us. It makes us feel despondent, ignored, Apathy threatens to set in, making us callous, bittered, and hardened. More than anything during these times, we want to know how long we must continue calling out to him and why he would allow these circumstances we're facing to go on. One of the things that I've learned, especially over the last several years, um, is that um, I don't ask why anymore. I don't ask, I don't ask, why are you doing this? Why is this happening to me? Blah, blah, blah. I always ask, what are you trying to teach me? Um, and that was huge for me. That totally changed my outlook and uh, how I pray and a lot of other things. Um, so I never ask him why. Um, I always ask him, what do you want? What are you trying to teach me? What are you doing? And what do I need to learn? Um, so she says, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. think of a request you've been bringing to the Lord for a long time. It's quite possibly the same issue you've kept at the forefront of your thoughts throughout this entire study. Um, use the prompts on the next page to help you fill in some of your questions to the Lord regarding the circumstance. And so how long? And so my answer was until the kids surrender their lives to you and make you Lord. And the why question um, why does it seem like they're getting further away? 
Um, it says, in light of your real questions and concerns, do you still expect God to respond and speak to you, or are you losing hope instead? My answer was, I still expect God to respond and speak to you. Um, he loves them with his perfect love and is constantly trying to open their eyes and fighting for their souls. Um, so page 170, we don't know how long Habakkuk had been calling out to God. But when God didn't seem to be answering, we do know this. Habakkuk pointed an accusatory finger. He started to lose confidence that the Lord would ever answer him. I want you to see the fact that Habakkuk questioned God, as we ourselves sometimes question God. But not only that, what I want you to see is that when God did give an answer, he didn't angrily scold this man who dared question the Lord's interest and involvement in these situations. Please do not let the beauty of God's grace go unnoticed here. Yahweh heard Habakkuk's questions, but received them mercifully and patiently. So those questions you wrote down, he's received your questions with grace too. Even the questions that remain tucked inside your heart, unshared, unspoken, unwritten. In his vast kindness towards us, in his knowledge of our frailty, God lets us ask, lets us ask our questions. And he may just answer them in even bigger and bolder ways than we've asked them. So she says to read Habakkuk 1, 5 in the margin, which says, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. Um, she says to underline the action verb, so I put look, observe, be astonished, and wonder. Um, and those are the actions that God commanded Habakkuk to take, and those are the same actions that he commands us to take. Um, she says, God wasn't off twiddling his thumb somewhere paying no attention. He was already answering. Habakkuk hadn't seen it because he'd been looking elsewhere. A wider vision changes everything. If we're looking, I mean really looking, we'll see the traces of God's hand all around us. Already speaking, already moving, already working things into the shape of his own wise will and providence. And what was true for Habakkuk was also true for Esther. So the book, this book of the Bible is the breathtaking saga of a young Jewish girl gifted with an unfair amount of beauty. When the king of Persia hosted a pageant to determine who his new wife would be, Esther was the one who caught his eye and ultimately his heart. Whatever she wanted, he desired to give her even to half of the kingdom, Esther 5.3. When a plot to annihilate the Jews was uncovered, Esther's cousin Mordecai stepped in to remind her of the providential hand of Almighty God in giving her such favor with Persia's king. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Indeed she had, because Mordecai's life was in danger, along with all the Jewish people, Esther included. His nemesis Haman, a high-ranking official in the palace, who actually cooked up this genocidal plot in the first place, hated him for his allegiance to Yahweh and his refusal to bow and scrape before Haman at public appearances. Hated him enough to hastily build a gallows specifically for use in hanging this man who got under his skin so much. Through all of this, Yahweh seemed oddly disengaged. In fact, his name is not even mentioned in the entire book. And yet to the one who has spiritual vision, his fingerprints and providential guidance are all over it. So let's dig into Esther 6. And this is kind of long, so bear with me. Let me get a drink first. There's a lot of reading today. <clears throat> All right. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king. On the king, I'm just going to leave it at the king. <laughs> and the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. 
And the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man who the king delighteth to honor. Oh man, pride always turns around and bites you in the butt, doesn't it? <laughs> Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said, and do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and brought him on horseback through the city through the street of the city, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate. But Haman hastened to his house, mourning, and having his head covered. And Haman told Zeresh his wife and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh his wife unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. Oh, my goodness. Like she said, God may not be mentioned in this book, but his fingerprints are all over that. Um, and so we are to answer the questions on the following page. 172. What couldn't the king seem to do on this specific night, the night after Haman co concocted his plan to kill Mordecai? Well, he couldn't sleep. What did he ask for to help cure his insomnia? He asked to be read the records of the Chronicles. So basically, it was just telling him about what happened that day. How did he discover, or what did he discover during his reading? He discovered that Mordecai had told the king of the two people who wanted to kill the king. And how did he respond in light of this newfound knowledge? He said, what honor and dignity has been done for Mordecai for this? So he wanted to know what he had done for this man who had saved his life. Um, so who happened to be in the king's courtyard at this exact moment? Oh, just who could it be? And why was he there? Well, hmm, lo and behold, it was Haman. And he was there to speak to the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the complete opposite of what the king's thinking. Um, and what did the king ask him? And he asked him, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now, he didn't say Mordecai's name, but he also didn't say Haman's name. But Haman was so full of pride that he was just like, oh, well, that's just got to be me. So given Haman's elevated view of himself, who did he assume the king was referring to? <laughs> himself. Look at the thread of coincidental happenings woven into the story. To the spiritually insensitive eye, there's no trace of God, his hand, or even his interest in the devastation about to befall Mordecai and the entire Jewish race. And yet, the king can't sleep. He looks for something to read. He comes across a record of Mordecai's past service to him. Haman shows up seeking permission to put Mordecai to death. 
The king, not knowing this, in fact, seeking counsel on how to honor Mordecai, poses a question that Haman is easily able to misunderstand, and in answering it mistakenly, Haman sets a ball rolling that leads to his own demise. The elevation of Mordecai and the salvation of the Jews, this kind of stuff just happens? Yes, when God is involved in it, just as he's involved with you now, right here in the midst of your hurts, fears, and disappointments, whether or not you perceive him at work depends largely on whether you're postured to look, observe, be astonished, and wonder, to be expectantly hopeful and eager for him, believing he's at work even when he seems distant. Yes, ask him your questions. Then immediately ask him for vision to recognize where his providential hand is already at work. Your personal problem is but a small sliver in the grand scope of all God is doing. Broaden your vantage point and prepare to be amazed at what he's already doing. That was just, that was just, that was powerful. That was powerful. And that is something that we need to learn. We need to, we need to have our spiritual eyes and ears and spirit open and be paying attention to what is going on around us so we can join him in his work, so we can see what he is doing, so we don't allow Satan to let us get frustrated and annoyed and disheartened and bitter thinking that God's just sitting up there ignoring me because that is not the case and that's what Satan wants you to believe. So we need to make sure we can ask him all the questions that we want, but we have to be spiritually attuned to his answer, to hear his answer, to see his answer. So I thank you guys for joining us again. Ooh, Detours by Tony Evans. So excited. Go to christianbook.com and order that because we're going to get started with that soon. I'm so excited. So you guys have a blessed week and we'll see you next time.